Welcome to this episode of Disease Du Jour on the topic of hind limb rehab tips and horses with Dr. Steve Adair of the University of Tennessee. I'm your host, Kim Brown, publisher of Equimanagement. The Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you in 2021 by Merck Animal Health. Dr. Adair is a diplomate in the American College of Veterinary Surgeons and the American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation. He is certified by the American Veterinary Chiropractic Association and Animal Chiropractic and is a certified equine rehabilitation practitioner. His special interests are equine rehab, lameness, and regenerative medicine. His clinical focus areas include equine lameness, rehabilitation, and orthopedic surgery. Dr. Adair holds a bachelor's degree in microbiology, a master's degree in veterinary microbiology, and received his DVM from Auburn University. Dr. Adair had joined us back in February for Disease to Shore episode 49 to talk about four limb rehab tips. And today he's joining us to continue the discussion to encompass hind limb rehab tips in horses. So thank you, Dr. Adair, for joining us today on Disease to Shore. Thank you, Kimberly. I appreciate it. Well, we're excited. And this is, I told you before, this is a topic that I'm really excited about. I think that veterinarians across the country can do more rehab in their own clinics um, and really help a lot more horses. And today we're going to be adding on to what we learned in your last discussion of equine forelimb rehab tips. Mm -hmm. So we're going to move back to the hind limbs and learn where equine rehabilitation has evolved there. Sure. So in the earlier episode, you said veterinarians have to start with an accurate diagnosis. So let's start a little about the, the diagnostics you use and the process that you use. Well, certainly, I mean, there are going to be certain things that are going to be obvious, uh, you know, that, that you know it's a traumatic event uh, and you've got, you know, classic signs of heat, pain, swelling. Uh, but then again, there's going to be other uh, areas that require uh, a much more involved diagnosis or diagnostics. Um, for the most part, when we're talking about hind limb issues, I mean, we're primarily going to be talking about musculoskeletal issues uh, as compared to uh, neurological issues, uh, et cetera. Neurological, while it does affect the rear end, it tends to be more of a total body uh, type of condition. So for the purpose, or at least for the majority of this talk, we will be addressing musculoskeletal. So, you know, again, the most accurate, I mean, the most uh, basic thing is to come up with an accurate diagnosis. And, you know, we're going to, as veterinarians, uh, you know, try to bring in uh, all these bits of information uh, in order to try to arrive at an accurate diagnosis. And that they, I mean, that starts with history and signalment in your physical examination. Uh, and then once you've passed through that aspect of it, the next is primarily going to be looking for evidence of, of uh, gait abnormalities. Now, I want to I want to differentiate um, is that we have painful gait abnormalities and we have non-painful. And, you know, everybody somewhat considers lameness uh, as a painful condition. Well, actually, that's not actually correct. You know, a lameness is a gait abnormality or a gait asymmetry. And so uh, what's your job as a a veterinarian, of course, is to figure out where that gait uh, abnormality or asymmetry is occurring. Uh, as an example, uh, you can have a painful lameness such as a proximal suspensory desmitis, uh, and that's painful. Uh, whereas uh, another case, you may have a uh, fibrotic myopathy which, uh, yes, early on in the disease process, it's, it's, it's painful, but after that, it becomes a mechanical gait deficit. And so uh, those, those are things that, that uh, you know, uh, we need to differentiate. So, you know, it basically starts with a good lameness exam. 
you know, and you're going very methodical uh, steps uh, for your lameness examination. Well, that's and that's a good point on on getting that good lameness in the history mm -hmm. all together. Sure. So you had mentioned, let's let's delve a little bit deeper into what are some of the most common injuries or specific conditions that you might use rehab for? Well, I mean, pretty much uh, uh, any type of, of joint injury uh, or joint surgery, uh, any type of soft tissue injury, be it muscle, tendon, and or ligament, uh, those are going to be the, the primary ones uh, that can certainly be utilized, uh, uh, I mean, uh, be rehabbed. Um, you know, it's there's certainly going to be a plethora uh, because even if you're not rehabbing a, a very specific area, you may need to be addressing other areas in the uh, in the hind leg. Uh, ex for example, uh, we know that if you've got a rear foot that has a low plantar hoof angle, uh, that you are going to have secondary gluteal pain. And so uh, while, yes, you would be addressing the foot uh, per se, uh, as far as trying to improve that plantar angle, uh, you probably will need to address the, the pain uh, and uh, uh, dysfunction that is occurring up in the uh, gluteal region. So... You know, it's a lot of stuff is all interrelated uh, or connected. And so uh, that's the other thing is, is part of rehab is that you don't need to become tunnel visioned and simply look at whatever the condition and or the injury is. You need to look at a little bit more of a holistic approach uh, and address other concurrent issues that are going on. Uh, that's but good. wait, I'm sorry. No, I said that's a good point because I know when I've gone to human rehab that they 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 will address whatever the, the cause of it is. But then, you know, if, if you've got a knee or an ankle or a foot or whatever is bothering you, you know, your back, they'll they'll be working on your back because mm -hmm. you've been make compensating and, and change things. So I I love that that's coming into equine rehab. It's it's certainly something that, you know, while and let's say you've got injury X uh, and because of that, the horse is certainly confined uh, to, let's say, a stall with with hand walking only. Well, there's other things that certainly can be addressed during that confinement period that uh aids the entire horse and aids in recovery, you know, such as uh, weight shifting exercises, such as stretching. Uh, there, There's other working on core muscles. Uh, those things can be done while the horse is just standing in a stall. And so you don't necessarily, again, you don't have to focus. You, you do need to address the injury but you also need to look at it, uh, look at other conditions that are going on because we're, it's, we're planning for down the road too. You know, it's not just that moment. We're looking at the next step and the next step and the next step and the progression uh, with the ultimate goal to, to get the individual back to some type of useful constructive activity. That's, that's a good way to term that. So let's talk a little bit about some of the therapeutics and the mm -hmm. therapies that mm -hmm. you use when you're when you're doing rehab on the hind limb. Sure. I mean, it's it's there are numerous quote modalities out there, but I do think and, and certainly anybody in your audience that has been to a physical therapist must rec recognize that a lot of what human physical therapists do are related to motion and related to exercise. Human physical therapy is not 
what we call modality driven per se. And when I'm talking about modality driven, I'm talking about your lasers, your your E-STEM units, your your uh, magnetic units, uh, those type of situation. Um, those would be what we would consider modalities versus you know, an exercise. So exercise, certainly hand walking, ground poles, balance pads, underwater treadmill, uh, flexing, passive flexion, stretches, all of those things are going to be looking at a more exercise and motion uh, type of, of, of situation. But if we talk strictly about, you know, modalities, uh, at least what I use a lot, uh, I do use lasers. Uh, I, I do think lasers are very beneficial uh, for a, acute inflammatory, uh, hot, painful areas. Uh, I do use therapeutic ultrasound uh, I, because I do think those are beneficial to warm up tissue prior to exercise. Uh, so I'll use therapeutic ultrasound. Certainly I'll use shockwave uh, depending on conditions uh, uh, that are observed. Uh, and, and then on occasion, we'll certainly use some pulsed electromagnetic, more so in the acute period using targeted PEMF uh, versus uh, uh, you know, the high intensity units. Uh, so those are going to be some of the, the, the modalities, but we do a lot with exercise to be real honest. We have shifted away from the, the let's jump and get our laser and then let's move on down to the next case. Uh, we tend to spend more times addressing specific movements, uh, targeted exercises, working on core muscles, working on strengthening uh, those type of, of, of situations uh, for our rear limbs. That's really interesting. And just, just as a uh, point that I'm sure some of the veterinarians will ask, what type of lasers are you using in this acute phase? Well, well it depends. I mean, we primarily use uh, two types, two classes. Uh, and so, uh, uh, we use a class four laser, uh, and we do use a class one M laser too. So those are the two lasers, uh, that we, we use root on a routine basis. I do have a class three B laser, uh, but I don't use it as much, uh, as, as I do the class one M, uh, or the class four lasers. Uh, both, uh, both of those units are appropriate for the inflammatory period. Now, I do think the acute inflammatory, now, I, that doesn't negate that they couldn't be used in what we call the chronic period too. So let's, as an example, uh, you've got a superficial flexor tendonitis that uh, is out of the acute period. Uh, it's it's the it's somewhat cooled out. Uh, it's not hot to touch. It's not as painful. So now we're introducing therapeutic exercises for uh, rejoining uh, and uh, uh, to for uh, for strengthening and remodeling those tendons. Well, during that exercise period, it it's, would not be uncommon for you to induce some inflammation because, I mean, it's kind of no pain, no gain. You right. know, as you exercise, you're going to be tearing some fibers. Uh, you may get some inflammation going on. And certainly you can use uh, lasers during that period, or you could use cold. I mean, we use cold a lot for the acute uh, inflammatory process, uh, whereas we shift over to heat uh, for the more chronic uh, tissue remodeling type of phases when we're talking about modalities. Okay. And maybe walk us through, pick up something that's very common that you address and maybe walk us through so veterinarians could understand how you would address a specific condition. 
Well, probably the most, the most uh, common condition that we're going to face here is proximal rear suspensory desmitis. And so that is, is uh, something we see weekly, to be honest with you. Uh, and so uh, wow. I think first thing is uh, an accurate diagnosis. And so uh, we certainly put them through a, uh, a, a lameness evaluation, uh, including regional or diagnostic anesthesia. So once we have localized it to that proximal suspensory, and excluded other things such as hock arthritis, uh, or maybe they do have concurrent hock arthritis, but we've kind of differentiated between hock arthritis and proximal suspensory. So we've got a, we've localized it to the proximal suspensory area. At that point in time, we want to try to get a handle on the severity of the disease uh, of the injury. Uh, and in an ideal world, I prefer to do MRIs. Uh, so from a diagnostic standpoint, so uh, because I think it's important uh, to get a full picture, uh, and that would include the bone where the uh, proximal suspensory inserts them. Uh, we can certainly ultrasound the area, but uh, anybody that's done uh, proximal rear suspensory ultrasonography, uh, it, that's a confusing area. Uh, it's not an easy area to get accurate images on. And we also know, uh, regardless of the structures that you're imaging, that uh, diagnostic ultrasound tends to under underestimate the degree of damage. Wow. So preferably, my personal preference would be try to do an MRI on them, which is not always uh, reasonable, uh, either due to size of the individual or uh, financial constraints. So <clears throat> with that in mind, certainly we do diagnostic ultrasound on, <clears throat> on them all, uh, just to try to get an idea. <clears throat> then, excuse me, then we, um, we do a lot of biological medicine, to be honest with you on these. Uh, and I was going to ask you about that today because I know mm -hmm. that you have a lot of experience in, in using some of these biologics. So, so what, when, how do you decide when to use a biologic and what do you prefer? Uh, I kind of go back and forth uh, for a while. Uh, my adage was, well, if I had a core lesion, I would be putting stem cells in it. Uh, whereas if I simply had fiber, disrupt fiber disruption and enlargement, I would be using uh, platelet-rich plasma. Uh, so those were kind of my two go-tos. Uh, my platelet-rich plasma, I was doing three ejections at two-week intervals. Uh, and then uh, with stem cells, Actually, I was getting by with just one injection. So I've got I've gotten to the point now to where I pretty much use uh, stem cells uh, almost exclusively on my proximal rear suspensory, and uh, the the reason being uh, from a from a cost standpoint, uh, they work out to be a, about the same. Yeah, stem cells are a little bit more expensive. But if you factor in the cost of hauling a horse to us three times on three separate occasions, you know, by the time you factor that, those costs in, uh, they're going to be just about equal. So pretty much uh, with most of our cases, uh, we tend to go with, uh, with stem cells. And uh, that's a whole nother field and probably a whole nother topic for discussion is the area that's called regenerative rehabilitation. And that's basically when you combine biological therapies with rehabilitation. So, uh, but th that's certainly a whole, a whole different talk. So uh, after that, uh, we do, uh, after I've done biologics, uh, 
then we certainly do uh, at that point in time, we usually do some for, form of exercise restriction. Uh, and that's certainly going to be uh, dependent on each individual. Uh, it may range from stall confinement and hand walking to a small round pin turnout okay. uh, type of situation. Uh, during that period of time, uh, while they're under that exercise restriction, uh, we're commonly going to doing balance pads uh, for weight shifting, uh, basically eccentric and concentric contraction. Uh, we're doing uh, our core muscle uh, with uh, abdominal lifts, uh, with uh, butt tucks. Uh, we do neck stretches. So all of those things are certainly being, uh, being instituted while they're in that exercise restricted period. Okay. Then we basically reevaluate these horses at 30-day uh, intervals, and we do both a lameness uh, evaluation and uh, repeat ultrasonography uh, is usually what we do. And then somewhere around the 60-day to 90-day mark uh, post-diagnosis, uh, we're usually starting to, to introduce some type of, of exercise. Uh, if we can do them here, uh, I usually start by putting them in the underwater treadmill. Uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much uh, our routine here. Uh, basically deep and slow, uh, slow walking uh, to encourage uh, uh, movement and then uh, buoyancy so they're unloading uh, that area. Today's Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the maker of prestige vaccines, Banamine, Panicure, Regimate, Protozil, and other trusted equine health solutions. Merck Animal Health works for you and for horses. Learn more about Merck Animal Health's comprehensive portfolio of products, as well as their ongoing investment in our industry, profession, and community through programs such as the Respiratory Biosurveillance Program at Merck animalhealthusa.com. Then uh, again, we, we reevaluate at 30 day intervals and usually somewhere around four months post-diagnosis thereabouts. Uh, usually if they're looking good and the lameness is subsiding and and ultrasonographic appearance looks pretty good, then uh, we'll start in introducing some riding work. Uh, and so for the first month, we're doing nothing but just tack walking. Uh, then we reevaluate, and if they're looking good at that point in time, we'll start adding some trot in. We'll do that for a month, and then we'll uh, somewhere uh, then we reevaluate and then we'll add in some canter or lope work uh, do that for a month and then so we have about a three month uh, two to three month uh, uh, riding exercise program uh, and then at that point in time uh, we're looking at these individuals and saying okay they look good now that is a time we need to start reintroducing their discipline work uh, if I had the opportunity between that four to six month range to do a second MRI, uh, that certainly would be the gold standard to, to look for healing. But oftentimes I, I, I can't do that. It's, it's cost prohibitive. So we tend to go more on clinical signs and, uh, and uh, uh, basically ultrasonographic appearance. Uh, of these. So hopefully by about the six month uh, post diagnosis, uh, we've got a pretty good handle and that horse is starting to return to, to uh, slow progressive uh, discipline work, uh, whatever that may be. You know, if it's a barrel horse, uh, they may be nothing more than uh, at, at that six month period, we may start them into walking their patterns. 
uh, do that for a couple of weeks or so, and then we may add them trotting their patterns. So it's just, you know, it's it's all a progressive, uh, gradual increase uh, in exercise, and it's very individual dependent. I mean, there's not there's not a recipe. Uh, I can't say do this, do this, do this, and you're going to do that for every uh, patient. Uh, uh, frequent reevaluations. Uh, looking at very specific outcome measures uh, and uh, addressing your rehab plan based on what that individual is doing. And, you know, you may find that maybe they start to digress. Well, if they start to digress, then you're going to have to look back and say, oops, I need to slow it down. Or maybe they're not progressing fast enough. And maybe you need to either speed things up or totally change your plan and go to some other some other exercise or some other modality, whatever the case may be. Okay. So that's just a, you know, a, a very broad uh, swipe at uh, how we do a proximal rear suspensory, you know, type of, of situation. Okay, and for some of these veterinarians, much of this can be done on the farm by the owner and how much needs to be done by a trained professional when you start working on some of these exercises? Oh, I, I'd say uh, the majority of, of work can be with, if you have a, a if you've got a, somebody that is a good horse person um, that uh, uh, I think a lot of it can be done at home. Uh, and so I, now certainly underwater treadmills and things like that, you know, in the, the modality driven stuff, uh, certainly can't be, uh, done, uh, it should be done by a trained individual, but, you know, walking over ground poles, for instance, you know, that's certainly something easy to do. Uh, walking over different surfaces, taking them from a concrete surface to a gravel surface to a grass surface to a dirt surface to help proprioception can be done. Okay. The stretches, the baited stretches, neck stretches, butt tuck, sternal lifts, etc., can be done. Uh, backing a horse to encourage uh, pelvic rotation that can be done at home. Uh, your balance pads, those can be. So there's a a lot of this uh, certainly can be done in out uh, at home. Now, and, and I'll be honest with you, I, it's that's what I think the veterinarian uh, uh, most of the time owners can't afford to have the veterinarian come out every single day and do all the different therapies. Um, and that's just cost prohibitive. Now, yes, there are individuals that can that run a rehab facility such as we have here at the University of Tennessee, where people certainly are more than willing to bring their horses in, drop them off and leave them with us for a month, two months, three months, four months, uh, and let us give them back a, a finished product. But for the most part, I think what veterinarians in private practice can do is to instruct the owners how to properly do uh, these different exercises and then do frequent reevaluations and adjusting the therapeutic plan. And Dr. Dare, how do these veterinarians learn? I mean, you you are a diplomate in in several things, but how did how does the common veterinarian out there learn to do some of these rehabs so that they are able to instruct owners? Well, and that's where uh, we get into uh, different continuing education events. Uh, there are uh, certainly a lot of your bigger meetings, such as AAP. Uh, VMC, uh, et cetera, uh, they are starting to have more and uh, uh, more equine rehab related events. Um, that is certainly one thing. There are there are going to be certain uh, certificate programs uh, that are available that can be utilized 
uh, to uh, to learn equine rehab and small animal rehab for that matter, just as there is for uh, chiropractics uh, and acupuncture uh, or imaging. Uh, there are other types of continuing education courses that the veterinarian can take. Uh, and then there are uh, professional development courses that are one or two day CE events uh, that are focused on specific areas. And certainly uh, all of that together can certainly give you the basics uh, and uh, allow you to, to certainly start designing some programs uh, for your client. Well, that's, that's awesome. And is there anything else, Dr. Adair, that you would like to say to veterinarians about um, well, I, yeah, I, I think important. What is important is is trying to to determine what works and what doesn't work, and hopefully you'll see that coming out more and so in the literature. Uh, you know, just because this particular modality or exercise or whatever it is works in humans doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work in horses. So I do think you you do need to not be swayed by the uh, the current fad or current hot item uh, that's out there that every, buy, every horse owner wants to use uh, and look at where the evidence-based medicine is and evaluate your therapies based on that. The other thing is, is you really need to come up with some objective measurement uh, to determine, you know, am I helping? Uh, is this making a difference? I mean, we, we tend to all remember our, our success stories, uh, but we tend to forget those cases that don't necessarily do as well as we want. And so, uh, I'm not a big fan of anecdotal uh, evidence. Uh, I, I really would encourage individuals to develop uh, some type of objective measurement. Maybe that's just simply taking your cell phone and recording a video, uh, having somebody flex a joint uh, and you video it, uh, and then you progressively follow it along to see if you're improving range of joint motion. Uh, maybe it's taking a tape measure and measuring limb circumference uh, and writing those measurements down. Uh, maybe it's using some type of inertial system, uh, sensor system to measure gait asymmetry, uh, you know, and coming back in, in that those systems give you a quantifiable number that you can come back and repair to. We do that every one of our cases that are within the hospital every week. If they can trot, uh, they're going to be hooked up to uh, the Equinosis Q, and they're going to have uh, their uh, their movement asymmetry evaluated. Uh, that way we know uh, – are we making progress? Or are we not making progress? Or are we making things worse? And so we do weekly evaluations on, on our in-house uh, rehab patients. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll certainly video them. Uh, we'll use goniometers to, to measure uh, joint flexion, range of joint motion. We'll use... Uh, 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 algometers, which are pressure, gives you a pressure reading, how much pressure you can apply to a specific point. Uh, and we'll use that to, to see if their area is becoming less painful. Uh, and then certainly we use radiographs and digital ultrasound, diagnostic ultrasound, et cetera, to also uh, measure uh, how things are going. So developing some type of objective measurement system, uh, you just need, you need to develop that uh, just so you know how these cases are doing. That's, that's a really good point. And I guess the last question I have is on pain management mm -hmm. because you know, there are some veterinarians who think, well, if they're a little painful, they won't be moving around as much, they won't damage it. 
And there's another group that say, you know, it's our responsibility to control pain in these animals. So sure. where is that fine line in between that, Dr. Adair? Well, I think from a rehab standpoint is that if you don't pain in order to to go through the the cascade of events from the time of injury to the time of recovery, uh, pain is going to be in there. And then until you uh, control pain, you're not going to be able to do effective rehab. You're not going to get them uh, moving. You're not going to be able to do effective range of motion, uh, et cetera. So you've got to break the pain cycle somewhere. So that may be uh, the uh, uh, pharmacology, you know, maybe it is using non steroidal anti inflammatories, maybe it's uh, joint injections, uh, maybe it's injecting SIs, uh, you know, maybe it's using laser uh, for inflammatory and painful condition. The, the bottom line is. Uh, there's there's two there's two caveats with in in rehab. One is immobilization is not our friend. Uh, it's been shown over and over and over again. Uh, try immobilizing an area, immobilizing a limb, immobilizing the horse uh, is, is not good. And this is especially true in humans. Think about if you've had hip replacement surgery, or you've had knee replacement surgery. My God, that afternoon, it's if not that afternoon following surgery, it's the next day, they've got you up walking around and moving around. Now, right. it's in a controlled circumstances, but they've got you up, and they're using, they're using a lot of ice. They're using pharmacological agents. They want you up and moving. And the same thing goes with the horse. It has to be controlled, though. OK, so uh, I think certainly pain control is extremely important in the rehab process in order to uh, in order to to adequately rehab an individual. If they've got a painful joint uh, and you can't get them to, to flex, you need to take care. You need to address that because we know for a fact that joint immobility is detrimental to the joint, uh, the cartilage, et cetera. So, uh, you know, I, I used to be, my adage, you know, we used to say, you know, 30 days in a stall, 30 days in a paddock, uh, 30 days in, in pasture turnout. Well, to me, rehab is more than stall rest. And so I really think that uh, uh, controlling pain, instituting uh, early controlled movement uh, is extremely important. And you said basically that there were um, two caveats in rehab. And the first one says immobilization is not our friend. Not our friend. Uh, is not our friend friend and then rehab is more than stall rest okay so that, that's that's basically that, that that's pretty it all relates back to to motion and moving uh is that uh, we need uh, we can do more for these individuals uh but again i, I do want to impress that it, it's it's dependent on uh the individual i mean if you've got a tenuous fracture repair uh then you may not be able to do motion, but maybe you can do some neck stretches. Maybe you can do some butt tucks, you know, uh, those type of situations. There are things that you can do uh, in lieu of just taking them out and running them over poles and stuff like that. So each case is an individual. Okay. Well, we sure do appreciate you adding on to this. Um, with, with this rehabilitation. And, and we may come back and uh, ask you again to come back and talk to us maybe about um, some of these other uh, treatments and sure. that, that we well, can I mean, do. There, there's a lot of different, uh, from a rehab standpoint, I mean, there's a lot you can do with uh, SI problems. There's a lot you can do with uh, uh, momentary upward fixation of the patella. Uh, there's things that you can do with stifle injuries, uh, fibrotic myopathy, 
Uh, and then certainly uh, you could, if you wanted to throw neurological cases with rear end ataxia, I mean, there's a lot of different different conditions that potentially can benefit from uh, some type of rehab uh, process. Well, we, again, thank you so much, Dr. Adair. I, sure. I love sessions and I, I hope we are able to uh, help more veterinarians become more interested and involved in this on behalf of their horses and owners. One, one other thing, Kimberly, just to, just to throw out, and you ask what can veterinarians do uh, to, to learn some of this thing, if, if you, I mean, let's not forget that just about every town has a human physical therapist uh, in that uh, area. And certainly uh, contacting a human physical therapist and just asking uh, for some tips from them. Uh, you, you'd be, um, it, it's amazing to me when I, when I, because I teach with a human physical therapist also, it's amazing some of the stuff that they are taught uh, in PT school. So I certainly wouldn't hesitate to recommend uh, find a human physical therapist in your area and pick their brain. Uh, you might be surprised on what kind of guidance that they can use, uh, give you. So just another, that's, just throw that, that out. That is a great tip. Yeah, and that's some, as you said, there's a, there's a physical therapist in just about every town. So that would mm -hmm. be a nice spot if you can't get out to get some, oh, sure. uh, some sure. veterinary. So. Yep. Well, we want to thank you again, Dr. Adair, for, for joining us today. And we want to thank our listeners for being here for Disease Du Jour. And a special thanks to our 2021 sponsor, Merck Animal Health. We invite our listeners to rate our episodes of Disease Du Jour on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen to your podcast. And if you have any questions or suggestions for topics, send an email to me at kbrown at equinenetwork.com. The Disease Du Jour is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of the Equine Network, LLC.